is the Director of Bird Ecology at the Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. And you may have read this part in the press release that we circulated, but I thought it was very exciting sounding. He's lived on a seabird island and counted hawks from a mountaintop, caught peregrine falcons on an east coast barrier island and introduced thousands of people to the pleasures of birds and birding. So we're happy to have him share some of that knowledge with us tonight. So thank you, Seth. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you. And thanks to all that are here. I am going to, um, uh, take away the, my videos because um, I don't want to be seen while I'm doing this. Um, I think I am anyway. There I go. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. I look forward to sharing my enthusiasm for bird study, especially migration, with, with you all. There will be some scripted slides. Um, and some off the top of my head commentary, as well as the question and answer session at the end. I wanna thank, first thank Ashley and friends of Sears Island for getting in touch with me. And I'd like to thank uh, Brenda and the Belfast Free Library for, for hosting this. And of course, thanks to all of you for tuning in. I'll try to touch upon some of the basics of migration, borrowing material from my former colleagues at Audubon as well as shared experiences, perhaps with some of you, and include a few tidbits uh, about my current migration work at Skudik Institute, uh, where, speaking of which, where we pursue collaborative solutions to critical environmental challenges through discovery and learning. Uh, we work in the intertidal zone in the forest. We do uh, uh, place-based learning and of course there's bird ecology. So this evening is an opportunity to pause to think about bird migration. Perhaps you can remember a time or an event when you first became aware of it. For many of us who grew up in the Eastern US and have more than a few decades of experience, perhaps you recall strings of Canada geese and that familiar honking while winging their way south in October above your home place. I can easily hearken back to my childhood when the neighbors would all come out on the street to listen and look up and we'd all feel a bit more connected to each other because of what we were witnessing. I remember as well during high school, I played soccer and during soccer practice, our coach would suddenly blow the whistle and have us lay down on our backs and look up at the sky to witness the passing, passing skeins of geese. It is, is it any wonder that we went on to the state championship two years in a row? In the United States, it used to be considered, I'm sorry, migration is a worldwide phenomenon. Over the centuries, people all over the globe have marble, marveled at seasonal movements of birds and wondered about it. There were theories such as birds went to the moon or some were transformed into other species and some spent winter in the mud beneath a pond or a lake. Whatever, birds certainly excited the human imagination. In the United States, it used to be considered sport to shoot migratory birds, particularly birds of prey. I grew up very close to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania, a place where hawks were shot for target practice, a place that was purchased by a well-to-do woman named Rosalie Edge, who then hired a courageous couple, Maurice and Irma Brun, who would convince shooters to lay down their guns and ammo and take up binoculars. That was in 1934, when the world's first sanctuary for migratory birds of prey was founded. Then protective laws followed. Now, a global network of preserves, sanctuaries, and bird observatories protect birds of prey. And here in the United States, all migratory birds are protected though there are current challenges to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Oops. 
why do birds migrate? Let's take a look at the basics of migration. Keep in mind that we could do a much deeper dive into each question or statement you will hear or read this evening. Migration is a strategy to take advantage of seasonally abundant food resources. It is the regular seasonal movement of individuals away from and back to their breeding grounds. A fancy word, philopatry, is a term for the tendency to return to the same location in successive years. It is not unreasonable to think that the catbird, hummingbird, hermit thrush, or yellow warbler you see at your favorite bird watching spot, or even in your backyard, is the very same bird you saw last year. Imagine, as some of us do, that these birds are family members who have been, who have been traveling and have returned home to see us again. Your backyard sings with their stories. Weather and photo period, and photo period is the amount of light in a 24 hour day in which birds are exposed to it, or the relative lengths of light and dark periods of a day. This ratio changes with the seasons and is an important cue that winds a bird's biological clock. There are many ways to characterize migration, seasonal, elevational or altitudinal, latitudinal, partial, nomadic, leapfrog, and austral. Austral refers to seasonal migration in the southern hemisphere in which birds typically move north in the fall and back south in the spring. When I think of austral migration, I think mostly of seabirds that spend the summer here in the northern hemisphere especially shearwaters. Earth has experienced changing environments throughout history. An example of environmental change is the, is the melting of glaciers from the northern hemisphere about 15,000 years ago. That was only the latest in a long cycle of more than 20 cycles that ebbed and flowed over the past two and a half million years. Various scenarios have been discussed and debated for over a century, but they have proven difficult to test because it is hard to reconstruct evolutionary changes in migration. There's a Southern home theory, a Northern home theory. There's a gradualism theory. So all of these, um, types of migration and their origins uh, have a play in the, in the uh, history of migration and in the academic side of, of migration. Of course, those of us who just go out and enjoy a walk, a stroll up Sears Island, we're looking for those hummingbirds, for the flycatchers, for wood warblers, especially in the spring. And I might say that this time of year when birds are returning to the south, um, it's just as fantastic to see wood, wood warblers there in the mornings. I've, I've seen flights of hundreds to a thousand leaving the island in the morning. The difference is in springtime, they're quite, the males are quite colorful. And in the, in the fall, all the birds are kind of uh, sort of duller, but no less challenging in terms of um, identification. In fact, a lot more challenging. So it's kind of neat to see. Some of the benefits of migration are that, of course, the birds avoid harsh and dangerous winter climates. They avoid the lack of, of finding food, or the hardship of, of trying to find food during winter. And that's especially true for in insectivorous birds, such as the wood warblers, which we were just mentioning, and especially fruit-eating birds, such as waxwings. So the waxwings end up being a little bit more nomadic, um, flying back and forth from areas where fruits may be more plentiful. Uh, this past year was a really good year for um, cedar waxwings hanging out throughout the winter. Um, 
and there were much fewer of the eruptive species, and we'll talk about eruption in a little bit, but uh, the, the bohemian waxwings were a little bit harder to find this winter where cedar waxwings, our local and more abundant bird, was uh, you know, fairly easy to find. So migration in total is a strategy for surviving. Um, and it, it's a great, great phenomenon to witness if you know where to go to see it. And we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Whenever a bird sets out on a journey, it runs the risk of losing its way. The ability to find their way to precise locations surely ranks as one of the most fascinating aspects of bird study. They, they, have a, um, they have and can respond to the magnetic fields of the earth. They can adapt to landscape features such as uh, the topography of mountain ranges or coastal uh, coastlines. Of course, wind and weather impacts their migration. They can navigate by night by the stars or by moonlight. And recent research is telling us that some of the birds are even oriented uh, or can orient through the use of smell. Birds that fly by day of course, uh, most of us think of, of hawks, hawks and eagles. They, they are the diurnal migrants, daytime flying birds. And uh, most, re most rely on wind updrafts, such as ones that come across the landscape, strike a mountain and are deflected upwards, and birds can take advantage of those updrafts. And then there are thermals. Thermals can occur over asphalt parking lots, over big cities, over outcroppings in the landscape, uh, natural outcroppings in the landscape. These are rising sort of donuts of air with, with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the lift. It, it gains, the birds are able to gain a lift in this donut of air rising up and the birds will follow it all the way up the lift up to the apex. They have great eyesight, some eight to 10 powers better than our hours in magnification. Then they can see the next thermal developing well out in front of them and they glide from one thermal to another to make their way southbound. When we think of hawk migration, we think of the accipiters, birds like sharp shinned hawk or cooper's hawk and the goshawk that like to uh, if you read the, the various field guides, they say flap, 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 and glide. So these birds, being of short wing, short rounded wing and a long rudder-like tail, um, that sort of morphology calls for them to be flapping and gliding. They can soar, but they're much more likely to use updrafts than they are thermals to make their way southbound. Whereas butios, or broad-winged hawk, broad-winged hawks, um, the species there are the, the species of broad-winged hawk, red-tailed hawk. Um, a little more obscure is the rough-legged hawk. And around here, if you're lucky, we can see red-shouldered hawks. All of those birds are sort of broad-winged, broad-tailed. They use that surface um, area to, to rise on those thermals and they catch those donuts of air and and whisk them their way, way high up into the sky before gliding on southward to find another thermal. They see these thermals because they can pick out insects at great distances. Or in one case, one time when I was on Hawk Mountain counting in my early career, um, we saw thousands and thousands of corn husks lifted into the air by some sort of quirk. And um, we, at first we thought, oh my gosh, look at all of these birds coming, only to look up with the binoculars and you see that they were literally pieces of corn husks flying through the air. It was bizarre. Nocturnal migrants, 
we've already mentioned in terms of a, uh, their way of, of navigating is by the, the night sky through the stars. But should it be cloudy, they still have ways of tuning in to the, to the landscape or to their routes um, by virtue of that magnetic field ability. Um, they fly at night mostly. These are a lot of the small songbirds. Um, they fly at night to avoid predators because we just got done talking about those hawks that like the daytime flying. And um, other benefits are usually at night, it's a bit calmer. There's more stable air. It's less energetic for the birds to, to get up on those, those winds and travel just above the treetops and, um, and maybe a little higher up to 1500 feet or so and, and make their way south. Well, how far do they go? That's always a question that I, that I get. And um, here is a little bit of a, let's see if this works. The black pole warbler is a kind of a, a unique little warbler. First of all, its weight is, is very light. You could literally stuff it into a first class envelope and mail it with a, a first class stamp. That's how light it is. Um, in terms of their movements, they come out of South America in the springtime and will sometimes head up to the Caribbean islands, but most likely will shoot all the way. You see that blue line going all the way over to Alaska. So some of these birds, a good portion of their uh, population, a good percentage, um, take a route that crosses the continent and gets them to uh, the boreal forest up in Alaska or the northern climes of Canada. And then the interesting thing is on the return, a significant portion, and this has just been uh, discovered really in the last couple of decades since we've been able to put uh, geolocators, nanotags, radio telemetry on some of these birds. Um, it turns out that a significant number of black pole warblers actually cross the continent and come to the shores of the main coast in the, in the down east coast and they'll harbor in the uh, spruce far, coastal spruce forests uh, to essentially stop over, get more insects, uh, feed up, uh, transform the feed into uh, magnificent amounts of fat, and then they launch out over the Atlantic Ocean and fly all the way to some to the Caribbean, down where that big oval shape is, or some even pass over the Caribbean and land in Northern South America. A flight as much as 70 hours, continuous flight of as much as 70 hours. Imagine a bird that's like as light as a first class letter flying 70 hours non-stop, just amazing. Well, I just talked about um, how long some of these birds can fly or the, the black pole warbler. But in addition, birds as small as the ruby-throated hummingbird or the wood thrush, can, they have the ability to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, not all birds choose to fly across water or want to expend that kind of energy or put up that kind of a risk uh, because, of course, they need just ideal conditions to make it across such a, uh, a geographical feature like, like the Gulf of Mexico. So some will bend around, uh, uh, sticking to the landward side, go through Alabama on over to Texas and follow down through the land bridge, so to speak, into Central and, and down toward South America. Fat is the most important fuel for migration. <clears throat> Many species double their weight with fat fuel for migration. Birds fuel their high intensity migratory flights by having a special physiological ability to metabolize fat along with a small amount of protein. For instance, songbirds convert a diet of insects and fruits into rich stores of fat, which fuel their awesome journeys. And if any of you have ever been to a banding station, you'll know that, that banders, or they call them ringers in Europe, 
uh, banders will actually blow on the body feathers of a, of a bird and you can look under the, the skin and see yellow deposits of fat, just like you would see on a store-bought chicken. Um, it's pretty cool to, to be able to see that, that yellow blob or yellow blobs underneath the skin surface of a small warbler like a black pole. So in this depiction, um, shorebirds, songbirds, and hawks, of course, all are migratory. Many of them go long distances. Typical body fat pre-migration for a shorebird is 66% of their body weight. A songbird, 70%. And the hawk, just a paltry 15%. Of course, we know that hawks um, are predators and have much more of an ability to uh, uh, you know, pick something off and eat on their way south. So we see these shorebirds much more long distance and, the, and some of the songbirds having a need for much more um, body fat. Um, they stop at these stopover sites, they feed up and then continue on their journey. So that, that me metabolic rate is really rapid and helps them to turn uh, their, their food sources in, into fat as, as they go as well, but they tend to need a couple of days at a particular stopover site some studies show five, 10, even 12 days of, of a pause in their migration to feed up and, and build up that fat before launching again. You know, you have to think about it sort of like, uh, you know, we drive our cars for a certain distance and then all of a sudden we look down and the odometer or the, the uh, fuel gauge says time to fuel up. We fuel up again, we take time to go do that. So birds are constantly, are, are doing that also during their migrations. There's, there's one bird, the red knot, a shorebird. Uh, pictured on the left is the, uh, the springtime bird moving up from South America to the Delaware Bay, which is a great stopover site for this particular species, which likes to feed on uh, horseshoe crab eggs. And in the fall, they turn into sort of a, 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 grayer, a grayer bird, as you see depicted at the bottom picture. But check out this, this body fat business. Pre-migration, 66, as we said in the last thing. And then after they, they make that journey from, the, from South America, coast of Brazil, wherever, up to D Delaware Bay, and they lose all of that body fat, they're down to just 3%. They have to refuel, and fortunately, evolution has timed their migrations with a horseshoe crab spawning the eggs, and um, it's, a, it's a tremendous protein and carbohydrate source, which is easily converted to body fat. For the, the rest of the migration, the red knots then head up to the Arctic. Uh, now, I hope you get a little laugh out of this particular uh, a picture. This is, this is one that's going to depict what it would take uh, we humans to do if we were a red knot and we wanted to refuel and travel the distances that they travel. Ready? Now, I know some of you that are out there listening, and I don't even think some of you could do that. I know I can't. So these stopover places are extremely important. And so here are some of the, the best known ones in, the, in, uh, in North America. Um, and probably uh, the, the reason why the main coast and the islands are in red is because it's a recently discovered uh, phenomenon that, that more birds are actually coming to, to uh, stop over refuel in our neck of the woods than we, we had previously known. So, so it's, it's pretty exciting and, and we're discovering these huge flights of, of um, staging birds like warblers like we talked about. There are places down toward Portland that do that. There's Sears Island is, is, uh, is one of those places, and I've already mentioned some of the, uh, the spruce-dominated uh, coast, coast up in the down east area, 
as well as some of these, um, these offshore islands. Matinicus, for instance, um, I've had friends who have banded birds there and, you know, uh, tens of thousands of birds have, have been banded in a, in a decade on some of these outer islands. More recently, saw wet owls were discovered as migrants along our nearshore coastal islands. So we're discovering new things about bird migration all of the time. That's why it is important to get out there, to be looking and, and to uh, be recording these things. So birds usually select the speeds uh, that are most efficient for their, their body type. And uh, here you see a list of, of some of the uh, miles per hour that they're thought to uh, uh, travel at. Loons, 28 to 50 miles an hour. Ospreys catching those thermals sometimes and gliding like they do can get up to into the 40s. Broad-winged hawks, 30 to 44 miles per hour. So you can see that you know, in an eight hour day times, you know, 40, uh, 40 miles per hour, that's a pretty good distance that some of these birds can make. And a broad winged hawk going all the way to uh, Central South America, you know, can do that, can do that trip in uh, anywhere from 17 to 30 days or so. It's a pretty amazing feat. Well, let's look at some of the migration strategies. Complete migration or obligate migration is a pattern in which individuals migrate to the same areas on the same schedule every year. Nearly all of the population vacates the northern areas and heads southbound, um, usually uh, uh, out of North America into Central or South America. As it says there, many of them travel incredible distances. Examples at the top, Cerulean Warbler, Wilson's Plover, Stilt Sandpiper are a few of the examples. And then partial migration or facultative migration is a pattern in which the timing and distance of migration changes from year to year in response to uh, varying environmental conditions. Some individuals within a population or species are migrants and others may not migrate at all, they're residents. Another term that is uh, applicable to this group is uh, called an, uh, nomadism or nomadic. Red-tailed hawk is an example, herring gull is an example, in the west, bewick's wren would be an example. And we talked earlier about uh, bohemian waxwings, the eruptive migration. These species are usually birds of the Arctic or the boreal regions that generally stay north during the winter, but occasionally erupt into lower latitudes, meaning they come to our area in the south um, and, and will spend the winter with us. So this year, uh, I should mention that uh, it's, it's predicted to be a, a, such a year for red-breasted nuthatch. So uh, I don't know how many of you are paying close attention, but already we're beginning here in, in Belfast, where I'm located, where my home is, um, we're already seeing um, little dribs and drabs of um, family units of red-breasted mer, uh, I'm sorry, red-breasted nuthatch. And, um, you know, so that's a, that's a special treat. They may hang out at your feeders for a little bit, uh, but look for uh, more and more of those to come through. Uh, again, getting, getting over to Sears Island for a walk uh, might, might yield some of the, uh, this particular species for you. So how do we study bird migration? Well, there's banding, which I mentioned. Um, so banding, of course, is taking a little bracelet, a little aluminum bracelet with an identifiable number on it and putting it on an individual bird. All birds that are banded get an individual social, social security number, so to speak. And um, they, the band is placed on the leg and, and off they go. Some birds get color bands as well so that we can tell where they originated. There's all kinds of ways of, of banding these birds. Um, one of the 
we've been doing that for over a hundred years or so, and we're we're finding out things. But the the limitation of of banding, of course, is that you have to see and be able to read a band if the bird is still living, and a lot of times banding is is best when the bird is found uh, found somewhere else and then has to be reported, and then uh, it goes through this. In this processing chain where information gets back to the original bander as to where the bird was banded. The yield on banding is, is far less than it is uh, than we're learning from radio telemetry or a nanotag such as depicted on the left in the bird in the person's hand there's a red red-eyed vireo and you can see that little um, smaller than thumbnail size nanotag which which is hooked by harness onto the bird. And uh, as the bird flies down the Atlantic coast or the Appalachian mountain chain, it's going past a series of towers where the nano tag is constantly giving out a, a frequency beep and the towers pick it up. And we're able to time stamp that particular bird on its particular migration. Um, and we can trace it hour by hour, day by day, as it goes past these, these particular uh, towers. It's, it's a really um, sort of revolutionary way that has really up, upgraded our knowledge of, of bird migration. Radar too is, is quite, quite popular. We learn from looking at weather radar that you can also detect large, uh, large flocks of birds, large flocks of insects sometimes. And so, um, here it's talking about a particular day when, when uh, some 14 million birds were detected over Cape May um, by the radar there. there there's even a, a website you can go to called BirdCast where uh, it's predictive radar. It, it actually puts together metadata from, from weather sources across the country. It looks at what fronts are doing and um, it's able to, uh, to, to tell us what we we might expect in a given week or it's usually usually a two to three to week long sort of predictive model that is um, dependent upon uh, piecing together different radars to give us that picture of course one of the old-fashioned ways was to just go out sit on the back deck favorite beverage have your binoculars look up at the night sky especially when there's moonlight, you can actually see birds flying through the moon. And or if the moon is not shining, I was out just the other night and I, could, I heard um, black-throated blue warbler go over. I heard uh, a wood thrush uh, go over. Right over the town of Belfast, they make uh, flight calls as they go. And that's a whole, different, a whole different set of skills than it is to learn their songs. Flight calls are are quite uh, hard to, to detect, but some, some are, are, are very identifiable. Um, again, on the left, a picture in the up, the, above the red-eyed vireo is a picture of a friend of mine who was studying night flight calls, and that's a homemade flower pot uh, recorder that we put on a big tripod, and you just leave it out there overnight, and it captures all the zeeps and chips and what knots that birds make. And from those recordings, we can uh, tell the volume of birds that are moving over, over an area in a given night. So moving right along, observing, of course, is one of the best ways to, to, to uh, take in, in bird migration. We have our favorite places, such as Cadillac Mountain, or in the springtime, if you're into hawk watching, you might want to go to Braddock Bay, uh, sorry, Bradbury Mountain in, in Southern Maine near Freeport. Um, there's the Belfast bird bus. You know, uh, the study, to study, we must be observant. If we observe, we can contribute to our understanding and our growing and ever-changing world. Um, some places are for collective learning in a social setting. Uh, we all have our favorite places and our favorite ways of doing things. Um, there's, there's safety in numbers. Uh, more birders usually mean more birds. And then there are the idyllic, dreamy sort of places, special places, hot spots, if you will, where um, uh, a sort of birding meccas are known, such as Monhegan Island. But then, of course, we all have um, 
one of our favorite places locally is Sears Island. And here's a, an, expert, uh, an excerpt from a bird watching expert. Um, I happened to pen these words for the uh, bird watching in Maine book that's edited by Derek Lovage. Um, if you'll indulge me a second. In spring, and especially in fall, following a night of strong migration, preferably on northwesterly winds that continue through sunrise, there may be no better place in all of the mid coast of Maine to be than Sears Island. By far, it is by far the shining gem of Maine coastal birding from Rockland to Mount Desert Island. Now, there's a cold front going through this very minute as we are speaking. Tomorrow morning at Sears Island, you might just run into flocks of songbirds getting an early start on their southbound migration. Check it out if you have the time, do it safely, social distance, all that good stuff. So we're gonna move now to sort of the um, more active part or, or what we can do. No matter where birds take us or the pleasure we derive from observing them, I posit that we must recipro reciprocate. Times are changing. At Scudic, we do a lot of bird and biodiversity monitoring. Uh, we're tracking spring arrivals. We're looking at fall hawk watch and sea watch. We do winter shore, uh, near shore surveys. And we track this thing, this tracking thing called phonology, where in particular, we're looking at when uh, certain plants will flower and fruit um, or that, that attract insects to them or caterpillars and then the birds that come to feed them. The problem could be that with accelerated heating, warming temperatures, the plants are speeding up their life cycle flowering earlier, fruiting earlier. Insects are coming to those things earlier, yet the birds may be on that age old sort of photo period biological clock that doesn't get them here to take advantage of that. And we could be witnessing things called phenological mismatch. And if that's the case, there may not be food for the young, for the parent birds to feed their young in the springtime or likewise in the fall when birds are making their way back southbound, bound, the types of caterpillars, fruits, and insects that they like to eat may not be available. These are the kinds of things that we wanna be watching and that we are studying at Scudic Institute. We're looking at climate and abundance distribution phenology. We're looking at invasive insects, shifting patterns in migration, population dynamics, and species range changes. Our human relationship with nature is certainly taking its toll. The biggest threat still is habitat loss. The assault does not need to be escalating. We certainly know better than to be using neonicotinoids on our, our seeds that, for which we're growing crops and so forth and so on. If we wanna save the birds, if we want to save the environment, have an ecological perspective, we need to be changing some of our human ways. We can keep our cats indoors, a simple, a simple uh, solution to a major, major problem. What is at stake? Do we really want Rachel Carson's Silent Spring? Do we really want a backyard devoid of hummingbirds? Do we really want a more silent, and less colorful Sears Island? Of course we don't. I need you to help spread the word. We can make a difference. Make your backyard a nature sanctuary. Mow less. 
promote pollinators. Let's all commit to doing what we can. I'd like to share with you a reading from a good friend of mine, Scott Wiedensall, who has penned the, uh, a book called Living on the Wind. And he says, right now, there are birds aloft in the skies of the Western Hemisphere migrating. Fall is one of the great pivot points of the year when continents are swarming with billions of traveling birds. Even the darkness moves with the passage of birds. The air is alive with the flight notes of unseen warblers and vireos, thrushes and orioles, sparrows and tanagers, filtering down through the moonlight like the voices of stars. Bird migration is the only unifying natural phenomenon in the world, stitching the continents together in a way that even the great weather systems which roar out from the poles but fizzle at the equator, fail to do. It is an enormously complex subject, perhaps the most compelling drama in all of natural history. Equally important, however, are the birds that grace our everyday field of view and hopefully inspire each of us to shared action toward a world with mutually beneficial conservation values. Here's a list of some of the sources from which I drew uh, tonight's program. And with that, I would like to thank you. Um, there is my email in case we, through the question and answers, we don't get to something or you wanna just uh, query me about whatever. I'm, ha I'm happy to uh, uh, chat with you individually that way. Uh, now I'll turn it back over to Brenda, I believe, for the questions and answers. Yeah, um, you can leave your screen share on or we can not, whatever you want to do. Um, so there is a question and thank you for that, Seth. Um, somebody asked, is 5 billion still the number? And I think that meant like 5 billion birds lost, but then you answered that. I think you said 2.5 billion, um, so. Yeah, the slide, the slide showed um, uh, or says 2.5 billion. If you think about it, the birds, the, the birds have just uh, done their breeding season. So let's say a, a couple million went north and they had young and they you know, quadrupled that number. So we're maybe at six or 8 billion birds when they start out of the Arctic and the boreal forest and begin to move southbound. But many of them perhaps perished uh, during the breeding cycle or at the end of it or now in the fledging time frame. And so we, we get round to uh, that 5 billion is kind of a, a, an average number that is, that is bantied about um, through the various uh, migration um, models that, that pull together uh, many dis different sources of, of, of information and data from the Arctic, from the boreal, uh, from breeding bird atlases and all that sort of stuff. So that's where they come up with those, those kind of numbers. Um, okay, so then we have another question. Uh, what effect will large scale offshore wind energy in the Gulf of Maine have on migrating birds? Well, that depends on what kind of bird you are. So uh, in truth, there has been quite a bit of um, off, at least here on the Atlantic coast, a good friend of mine uh, has participated in, in uh, uh, wind turbine uh, surveys to look at and then looking at bird altitudes and flight altitudes of birds and the way they go through these things. Certainly an individual turbine here or there is probably harmless. Uh, for the most part, there are studies uh, such as out on uh, Vinyl Haven, I believe, where there are three turbines. Um, there, uh, relatively few birds were, have been impacted by those turbines. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, the, the study year that I, uh, I think it was 2000 and I want to say 15 or 16 when some, some information was released from that study, but that's only through three turbines and 
half the time, I think only two of those turbines were, were working. The problem becomes a large sort of wind farm, if you will, where there are many, many turbines. They're, they're in some sort of uh, geometric pattern out in the, out in the ocean. Um, these, these things can be harmful. Uh, birds have to withstand going through you know, some distance of, of uh, churning turbines and um, that, that presents uh, a problem. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, a, cited, a study that I can cite to you at, right at this moment. I could dig some of that kind of stuff up. Um, but I, I also want to emphasize that, it, that you know, these things can be done uh, responsibly. There are many um, turbines along mountain chains where we know birds of prey fly. There are uh, places and uh, ownership of these turbines, be they utilities or whatnot, that are, that are learning to um, either slow or in, entirely stop their turbine uh, churnings, workings, during heavy flight times when the birds are actually migrating through. So we are making, we are making progress with that. And I also want to point out that large solar fields are equally as dangerous. There are some fields in the West, um, solar, you know, expanses of solar farms where birds, again, flying um, across a field of, of solar reflection um, can essentially cook Close. immediately, cook to death right in midair. And um, so, you know, we have our problems with our you know, human generated uh, energy sources. But I think that uh, through cooperation, we may be, over to be able to overcome some of these obstacles. Hmm. That's interesting. Thanks for that answer. Um, we have another question in the chat. Uh, will the planned salmon farm in Belfast have an impact on migratory birds? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, for, okay, so this is my personal opinion. I have not studied this, although I have, ha I have years of observation of, of that neck of the woods, the Perkins Road, the Good Karma Farm, our good friends down there who host uh, fields of bobolinks. Um, already the, the several homes that are on the south side of the Perkins Road have impacted the number of, of bobolinks that are breeding there. Um, Surely putting in that, that salmon factory um, will, will impact uh, those breeding birds and some of the other birds that breed locally. In terms of migration, I don't think it will have that, that big an impact on, on migratory birds directly. Um, well, that's all the questions. Oh, wait, here comes another one. Um, how do birds protect themselves during a hurricane? That's interesting. Yeah, so, uh, so that's a very, very good question. Um, they, they, if they can, they avoid it, fly around it. If they're caught in it, they're at its peril. So uh, birds can, you know, put down and shelter. Uh, that's for sure. But in a hurricane, they often get blown off course. Uh, that's how we get some of our strange vagrants that visit these areas. Um, sometimes birds mistake uh, wet asphalt for a big lake and they'll land. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways that uh, they can be disturbed by a hurricane. Um, I'm afraid that pr protection in a hurricane is probably um, the best method is to avoid the hurricane in the first place or, or go around it, lest you be subject to being blown off course or um, meet some sort of fate worse than that in a hurricane. So where do they get their weather information? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, these, uh, the, that, that innate evolutionary ability over millions of years, as uh, they're, out, they're a little bit out in front of our, our great systems of radar and all those other things I talked about. Um, I believe birds, if, if we really knew the birds, uh, and and uh, could know could know what they're up to. We could better predict what's going to happen uh, uh, across the planet. Um, so they have one up on us in terms of their connection to nature. 
<laughs> okay, so here's a good question. Um, do the birds we should be expecting in the next month differ if you are in Belfast or further inland in Waldo County? How much does it change from the coast to inland? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's not gonna be th that much different. Um, you should be able to see um, these passing wood warblers and vireos and things like that, that that make their way sort of through the inland uh, portions of, of Waldo County. But what happens uh, along the coast is, keep in mind these, the, the birds that you might see at Sears Island, they're, they're migrating at night, they're along the coast. They might be just off the coast, like a little bit out over the water, maybe skirting the tops of, of some of these islands in the, in the Penobscot Bay region. And um, you know they fly from 10 o'clock at night till two, three, four in the morning. And if the conditions and then begin to sort of hop through the trees. And they, if you stand down at the, at the gate area, just, just uh, inside of the gate at Sears Island, you don't even have to walk Sears Island. You can stand there by the kiosk. And the birds that do this, that land late, uh, late in the night, early in the morning, that are now sort of still restless and moving, they want to hop to the north end of Sears Island and then launch again, even over the, the sort of out over the causeway and that little bit of water, what we think of it as a little bit of water. Um, and you see them, I've seen them, like I said earlier, hundreds to thousands of birds moving in the morning. So the coast is, is much more of a kind of a migrant trap than is, than is the inland where there's sort of continuous landscape and geography for the birds to, uh, to put down and then move through. You, you just see greater volumes at a, at a trap place like Sears Island or Monhegan Island or Sandy Point down near Portland where Derek Lovich has a, a morning flight uh, program. Yeah, oh cool. Um, somebody wants you to explain the bird bus, the Belfast bird bus bus. <laughs> Yeah, so the, bird, the, the Belfast bird bus, quick story. Um, when MBNA uh, exited our area, left the area, they, they gave to the city, uh, they gifted the city with a 24 passenger handicapped accessible bus. And uh, one evening I was watching the town council meeting on television and um, uh, I think uh, Mike Hurley asked for, hey, we have this bus, what are the ideas? Anybody have any ideas that are out there? Um, the next morning when uh, the city clerk opened the office, I was standing there with my idea. And I said, well, we could, we could start this bird bus. We could put people on that bus. I can take them around the area and show them the birds of Belfast and beyond. And um, presto changeo, uh, it was born. And we, we uh, had many successful years. I do want to say that the the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition has been instrumental in supporting that. Uh, it eventually went from the city council to the, to the Y, and the Y kept up that program as long as I could sustain it. Um, my job situation shifted from Audubon to Scudic. It's a little harder to be at Scudic and here in Belfast at the same time. So the, Bel uh, the Belfast bird bus is, I won't say that it's, uh, dead and gone, but um, it, we would have to specially resurrect it for uh, special days. So look for that in the future. I think we might, we might want to do that again. I think that's a great idea. So um, I have another question, and this could be the last question, unless you want to keep going. Um, do different species migrate together in, in the same flocks, or do they stay in species-specific flocks? Uh, it, you, you most likely are to find them in mist, mixed, sorry, mixed flocks. Again, uh, think about uh, they're, they're going at night. They do these location calls to stay in touch with one another. The, the conditions are 
when you're a small songbird, you're a warbler, a vireo, an oriole, um, you, you benefit by the conditions that exist at night. So a lot of different species get up and move and they stay in touch. And then when daylight uh, comes on, they put down in these, in these forests, such as the forests of Sears Island, and many, just like birders, if we're all together and we're in a group, we're apt to see more birds. More birds of different species coming down into a forest are exploiting different uh, niches, different places where insects are and all that stuff. They stir up more food resources and are uh, better able to feed the crowd, so to, so to speak. So it's kind of a, you know, a potluck on the move. And um, so it's a mixed, mixed species are what you're likely to find. However, if you see one black pole warbler on a day, you might see six or eight or 10 or 12. Uh, same with red starts. So you, you can see um, on these fantastic mornings, um, you know, I've, I've seen 47 blue jays together. I've seen, uh, you know, 27 orioles. I've seen 500 uh, warblers of different species together. So yes, mixed flocks is, the, is what you would expect. Oh, that's cool. And just one more last question. I think you've been talking about this a little bit, but what is the best time of day to watch birds migrate? Is it the morning? If you're not going to get up in the middle of the night, would it be the morning? <laughs> Absolutely. I would, okay. I would get my tail over to, to Sears Island right there by the gate um, uh, just after the break of day. Okay. And, and nice spend job. maybe two, three hours. Again, you don't have to walk very far. If they're moving, you will know it in an instant. They'll come right down to the north end, hopping to the last tree, and then and then and then they fly out over the causeway. Now, some of them might be quite high and un, un, uh, unidentifiable, but that's why we have bird books now that show the underside of wood warblers and the patterning of color. Um, and um, some of us are trying uh, to learn that quickly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank also, you, so, you know, so much. I'm sorry. Go on a um, go on a, a field trip with uh, with with somebody knowledgeable. The Belfast Bay Watershed does that. Sears Island Friends of Sears Island has sponsored trips. The best way to do it is to is to go with groups. Of course, this time of year in these conditions, you want to practice uh, social distancing and so forth. Um, be very safety conscious. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Brenda and Ashley. Thank you very, very much for uh, uh, hosting me this evening. And thanks to all of you that have stuck with it um, the whole hour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seth.